So let's go to the next speaker is Holland Strauss. Okay, so this is joint work with uh, Daniel Kramer who's in Bonn. So optimal sales contract with withdrawals right. <coughs> So, um, yeah, um, some of you may have seen uh, uh, some version of this paper before, even under a different title, Benefits of Sequential Screening. Yeah? Um, we, uh, the, so this is, the, this is the same paper, more or less, but we put it, uh, well, we hope at least, uh, in, in a nicer uh, perspective or a nicer application. Yeah? <coughs> so um, we talk about contract withdrawal rights now. Yeah, so, uh, what are contract withdrawal rights? Well, there's a big you have to make a big distinction between so-called voluntary rights or mandatory rights. Mm -hmm. So, <coughs> when people write a contract, yeah, they're all, of course, yeah, uh, free to write into the contract a withdrawal, a right of withdrawal. Yeah, so that I would call a voluntary right of withdrawal. Yeah, and that can then be part of the optimal contract, and this is kind of an endogenous withdrawal right. Yeah, so it's non-restrictive. So what we are talking about here is something which is a, a limitation on contract and restriction on contracting, so-called mandatory withdrawal rights. Yeah. And we think they are actually um, not studied very much, but still there are a lot of uh, contexts where yeah, there is this withdrawal uh, right yeah, put on yeah, as a restriction on the contracting space of, of uh, contracting partners. So just a few examples, so labor contracts, yeah, we know that people, yeah, we have non-slavery conditions and yeah, you cannot keep uh, <coughs> uh, the, uh, the worker yeah, uh, uh, on any condition, yeah, the worker can always leave at will, yeah, you have limited bonding, you cannot ask the worker to give up a bond before they leave, yeah, so the worker can always withdraw, yeah, has a right of withdrawal if the employment relationship turned out badly. Yeah, so in academia, if you look for a different job and you already have tenure, yeah, you often uh, even uh, take an absence of leave yeah, in order to find out whether the new job is, is nice. Yeah, you can always come back. Yeah, you can always withdraw from, from the new tryout of the job. Yeah. Another example are procurement contracts. Yeah, so in procurement contracts, uh, when the contractor is a firm, yeah, protected by limited liability, there's always the risk that this firm may go bankrupt, the contractor may be bankrupt, and from the yeah, uh, procu procurer, this looks like an exit option yeah, of the, of the uh, contractor, yeah, a sort of withdrawal right from the, uh, from the contractor. Yeah? So what we'll be focusing on, or what I'm be focusing on today, is uh, withdrawal rights in the context of, of consumer contracts. But I think the other two examples would fit our story as well. Yeah. So in consumer contracts, um, our application is uh, EU, the European Union, yeah, has uh, <coughs> has a regulation on so-called distance sale contracts, which is basically any contract you buy when you buy goods over the internet that you're allowed to return these goods yeah, without any questions asked uh, 14 days after receiving the good. Yeah? And it's, not, it's more than a return right, yeah? you actually withdraw from the contract, yeah? you can cancel the contract without any problems for 14 days, up to 14 days after receiving the, <coughs> the, the, the contract. So our question is, yeah, uh, yeah, what of, of this paper is, how do these mandatory withdrawal rights yeah, affect optimal contracts? and I'll focus on uh, the consumer, uh, consumer contract case. Yeah, so our main application is the sale contracts of the EU regulation. So here are two sections, direct quotes from the regulation to give you a little bit an idea what, what, the, what the idea of the regulators is behind this, uh, this withdrawal, right? Yeah? And I just, uh, I'll just quote a little bit. So since in the case of distance sales, so this is internet sales, for example, the consumer is not able to see the good before concluding the contract, he should have a right of withdrawal. Yeah? And the quote of uh, section 47 uh, says something similar, yeah, especially the last part is interesting. For example, the consumer should only try on a garment and should not be allowed to wear it. Yeah? So that's the idea of why, why to give a withdrawal right. You buy a jeans yeah, or shoes over the internet and you cannot try it on like in a shop. Yeah? And um, uh, that's therefore you, uh, should give, you, you should get uh, a right of withdrawal. Yeah? So this is not a voluntary right, yeah? this is in, written into the regulation, this has to be part of the contract. Yeah? And um, so if you uh, yeah, read these quotes, yeah, what the regulators more or less have in mind is that if you compare 
uh, yeah, buying, buying goods in a traditional shop to buying goods over the internet, yeah, then the informational position of the consumer yeah, is worse over the internet and there's some protection yeah, uh, idea behind this regulation to restore, re, yeah, restore the consumer's informational position. So one the question you could ask is, well, does this work? Yeah. Okay. So what is uh, well, what is the idea uh, of this withdrawal right? Yeah, how does it connect? What, how do we model? Will, how we will we model it? Yeah. So it's about uh, information. Yeah. So we have a consumer. Yeah, who has some willingness to pay. Yeah, some idea about the willingness to pay. I need a new jeans. Yeah, but I don't know. Yeah, whether I need a, one for Levy or or another kind of jeans. Yeah. And only when I see the product uh, yeah, and try on my jeans, I actually yeah, obtain additional information, and I better know my. Uh, yeah, willingness to pay. Yeah. So how does it work in a traditional shop? Yeah, you go to a traditional shop, you try on the jeans, and then yeah, you conclude the contract. Yeah, and you buy the product. Yeah. So in a traditional shop, yeah, the, the right model yeah is yeah uh, into this simply the monopolistic screening model yeah, in a monopolistic context of Baron and Meyerson. Yeah. Now the, uh, the idea uh, here is in a distance sales situation over the internet, you don't know yet this information, yeah, how, whether the uh, shoes with, with will fit or the jeans will fit. Yeah? So the consumer learns additional information after contracting. Yeah? So a distance sales contract in the, we're taking into account this informational aspect yeah? is more, uh, yeah, more in line with a sequential screening model from Corti and Lee. Yeah, where you have some, uh, where the consumer or the agent has some ad example private information, but get more private information later on in the relationship. So then, uh, if you want to narrow down what we're doing, yeah, we are asking the question: How do withdrawal rights affect sequential screening? Yeah. Okay. So what we're going to do is, uh, yeah, yeah, something reasonably simple. Yeah. Uh, we're going to take the Cortielli framework and we will put in withdrawal rights there, and we'll see what comes out comes out of it. Okay. So what is the what is the model? Uh, so we have a uh, yeah, principal and agent. Yeah, the principal wants to sell something, the jeans, yeah, the shoes, uh, uh, to the agent, and theta will be the agent's willingness to pay. It's somewhere between zero and one. Yeah, and the cost of the uh, production yeah is, is C. Yeah, and that's the cost to the principal of producing the good. Then the terms of trade are very simple. There's a probability of the sale, that's the X, yeah, and a, and a transfer from the agent to the principal, uh, some, some amount in R. Nicely simple quasi-linear framework. The principal's utility is simply what he gets as a transfer minus the cost, yeah, uh, times the probability that he will actually uh, supply the good, and the agent's utility is simply his willingness to pay times X minus what he has to pay. Yeah? So very, very standard. So, what is now the information uh, information structure uh, underlying all this? Yeah. So the cost C is will be common knowledge. Yeah. Everything is known about that. The principal agent uh, know everything. Yeah. So what happens in period zero before uh, the contract is written? Yeah. The agent yeah does not learn theta. No, he learns yeah uh, that his true valuation, the theta, will be drawn from this distribution G I. Yeah. And this is its common knowledge. Yeah. That this I. O yeah, occurs with probability pi. Yeah. So I, yeah, what, uh, what I am yeah, as an agent, yeah, is this X on the private information, yeah, is already a little bit that I know something more than the principle about how much I will need my genes. Yeah. Okay. So then in period one, so I, yeah, okay, then in period one, the principle offers this contract specifying some, some menu maybe from the combinations of XT. Yeah. And then, after yeah, the, uh, yeah, concluding the contract over the, uh, over the internet, yeah, the, I get my jeans sent home, I open the package, I try them on, yeah, and then I really learn whether they fit, yeah, I learn my real theta. Yeah, so theta is the ex-post type, yeah, my real valuation, yeah, and this is private information of the agent. Yeah, the principal does not see whether the jeans will fit when I try them on at home. Yeah. And now the really new thing in comparison to Corti and Lee, because this is just like in Corti and Lee, is now this uh, in bold red. Yeah, the agent, ag agent can simply withdraw after learning his ex post type and get his outside option of zero. Yeah, so he can send the good back and then the contract is, uh, uh, is cancelled and he gets back all his refunds and, and all everything he paid. 
Okay, and if the agent says, no, I like the genes, I'll keep it, then the contract uh, remains valid. Okay? So, what are the assumptions uh, we have to put on, on, on this, this structure here? So, some technical ones. Yeah, the GI is differentiable, that's how it's, uh, and the density exists. It has a non-shifting support, so theta lies always between 0 and 1. Yeah. Then um, we have the hazard rate, yeah, which is common in, uh, in mechanism design, yeah, uh, contract theory. Uh, it's monotone, it's increasing, yeah, and a new thing we'll need is what we call so-called uh, cross-hazard rates. So you see that here there's a GI, and here is the density is a small j. Yeah? Okay. <coughs> so the cross-hazard rates yeah, in our framework will assume will also be increasing. Yeah? Okay. Um, uh, well, do these uh, distributions exist? Yeah, they exist. Yeah, so if, for instance, if the GI is, is convex for all i, that's uh, satisfied. And uh, yeah, so we don't need any additional assumptions. I'll come to that uh, in comparison to Corti and Lee. They, uh, need, they don't need this, but they need something additional. I'll come to that, okay? So, what are the contracts? Yeah, well, we can, what do contracts do we have to consider if we want to find the optimal contract now for the principle? Well, we can appeal again to a, to a revelation principle yeah? in the dynamic framework here. So, an optimal contract is, dynamic, is direct and incentive compatible, meaning that the agent yeah, has to report the information immediately after receiving it. Yeah? So, at the contracting stage, he has to report the I, yeah? <coughs> and then he reports the theta as soon as he learns the theta. Okay, so what is a direct contract? A direct contract is a menu of XTs, yeah, where there is a reporting about the, about the I, the type, uh, and reporting later about the theta. Yeah, so that's the general contract we have to consider, uh, given the dynamic revelation principle. Yeah, in the period R1, the agent has to report uh, his exante type, and in the period two, uh, his uh, theta type. Okay, so what about the sense of compatibility? Yeah, part of the uh, revelation principle. So the period two, they are standard, yeah? So I have to make sure that given that, uh, that I had already reported some type, J, yeah? I am going to report the truthful, the theta truthful, yeah? Okay. So what are the incentive compatibility constraints uh, for period one about, uh, about my I, yeah? <coughs> so I have to t tell truthfully at my I, yeah? Given that we have a uh, uh, non-shifting support, yeah, I will also have truth-telling truth of the equilibrium path. So my incentive constraint is quite simple. Yeah? Uh, I just have to make sure that yeah, I can assume that I will report my theta later uh, uh, honestly. Yeah? Yeah, that's not uh, without loss of generality. It comes from this one. Yeah? So the incentive constraint of the first period is, is very straightforward. Yeah? Um, uh, it holds on and off the equilibrium path because of period two. Okay, so individual rationality, when do I participate? Well, uh, of course, this is a standard uh, in, in individual rationality constraint in the Corti and Lee framework. I just, to have, yeah, I just have to make sure that when I'm buying the product, when I'm ordering over the internet, yeah, then on average, yeah, I get at least zero. Yeah? Now, what is now the new thing? The new thing that we add is, no, we don't only need, on average, zero. We actually need for every state yeah, that the agent gets, yeah, likes the genes, yeah, is willing to keep the genes, yeah, um, doesn't send it back. Okay? So the whole new thing is just adding this simple little constraint. That's all. Okay? So I didn't say anything silly yet, I think, but... Yeah. So, uh, the principal's problem yeah, uh, with withdrawal rights is that simply we're going to maximize the expected uh, payoff of the principal, so the transfers, the expected transfers they get, he gets, minus the cost, yeah, under these incentive constraints and these individual rationality constraints. Yeah? If we do the, the standard approach, if you forget about the withdrawal rights, yeah, I have almost the same problem, yeah? uh, I just can't forget about the IRXP. Yeah? And this is what Corti and Louis do, do yeah? and this is this sequential, what we call sequential screening. Okay? So here is what Corti and Lee get. Yeah? If you take this additional assumption that uh, yeah, these GIs are, yeah, are ordered, yeah, stochastically ordered in the correct way, yeah? then we have that indeed, yeah, uh, on, under the optimal contract, the principal screens sequentially, yeah? saying that it offers menus yeah, where yeah, he offers different yeah, combinations of 
uh, of probabilities of sale and transfers yeah, depending on the ex ante private information. Yeah, so the ex ante private information in this framework is really used. Yeah, that's really screening by the eye and screening about theta. Yeah. Okay. So what is our result? Our result that yeah, as soon as you or, or if you put in these ex post uh, individual relationality constraints, yeah, you lose all the benefits yeah, from sequential screening. Yeah. Uh, what the optimal contract will be like is yeah, it's no longer uh, really conditioned on I, it's trivial, yeah, the contract. Yeah. And what actually the principle offers yeah, is the optimal one given his average yeah, belief about the agent. Yeah. So it's as if the principle says, okay, just wait until you get all the private information and then we write a contract. Okay. So what does that mean for our application? Yeah. Well, yes. So withdrawal rights indeed safeguard the consumer's informational position. Yeah, he will buy with the same. Yeah, he will buy and contract basically under the same conditions as going to a traditional shop. Yeah, it is as if the contract is offered after observing your theta only. Yeah. And we could also say, yeah, go a, bit, a little bit beyond that. Yeah, that these withdrawal rights really level the playing field between internet and traditional shops. Okay. So. Um, yeah, so that's about the application. So we're here at the workshop on economic theory. So let me now uh, <coughs> concentrate on the theory. Yeah. Okay, so now I would like to show you or demonstrate uh, why we get this proposition too. Yeah. So two benchmarks. So let's start first when uh, to assume yeah, when the x ante type, the i, yeah, is actually known and we have x post ir. Yeah. Well then, what the, what we have is, is, yeah, is a traditional uh, monopoly problem, yeah, uh, Baron Myerson, yeah, where uh, both the pr principal and the agent know that the theta will be drawn from the GI. So what do we know about this? This is a very well-known studied problem. A fixed price is optimal, so that means the pr principal will offer just a, 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 a cutoff, a fixed price. Uh, this is the price, yeah, probably, is, yeah, uh, and depending on I, yeah. And the agent just buys if his theta is larger than the price theta i. Yeah, so that means that the profit of the principal is just with this probability the theta will be larger than theta i. Yeah, and this is what he gets. Yeah, so this is the classic trade-off between rents and efficiency. Yeah, uh, how do we find the optimal price? You get this virtual surplus and you see where the virtual surplus is, zi is zero. Yeah, uh, so that defines then a critical, a critical price and that's the optimal contract. Okay. So, uh, second benchmark. Yeah. What if, yeah, uh, we are the principal yeah, does not see I, or yeah, when we can, the principal cannot condition the contract on I. Yeah, that's what we call a static situation. Yeah, where the screening yeah, is not allowed with respect to to the ex ante private information. Well, then we also have a rather standard problem. Yeah, <coughs> because yeah. What the principal then does is he just considers the average distribution. Yeah. You calculate the ha hazard rate of the average distribution. Yeah. And now you have the same monopoly problem again, but now with respect to the average distribution. So there will be a, fi a, a cutoff again. Yeah. And the cutoff is now this average, followed from the average um, virtual surplus. Yeah. Um, and this is also, of course, what you what you get when yeah the consumer gets all this information up front. Yeah, what this happens in the traditional store. Okay. So two benchmarks. Yeah. So let me first give you an intuition for for our result. Why we get this this result? And uh, we'll do it with two x ante types. Yeah, and restricting attention to a menu of option contracts. So what is an option contract here? An option contract is that what the principal offers the agent is a contract consisting of an upfront fee yeah? <coughs> and then after learning his information theta yeah, he can then uh, exercise his option to keep the good yeah, to really buy the good for the exercise price theta hat. Yeah? So the idea is if the agent picks this uh, option contract he pays F, he then sees theta yeah? and then he says well is it now worth for me, worthwhile for me to actually exercise my option pay theta hat or not. Yeah, so that's the idea of a standard option. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what? Uh, okay. So I have to stand a little bit more closer here. Yeah. So um, with only an ex ante 
uh, participation constraint, so this is the standard quality and leaf framework, yeah, um, <coughs> we can have actually that the upfront payments yeah, can be negative. So this is going to be important. Yeah, and that will be the big comparison to a situation where we have an ex post participation constraint, because then we cannot have yeah, uh, negative uh, um, upfront fees, yeah, because if you then send the good back, yeah, you end up with negative utility, and it is not possible. Yeah. Okay. So let us suppose, yeah, let us see uh, whether you, the principal really, when using these type of contracts, would like to keep on screening on the ex-ante private information on the, on the I. Yeah, so suppose yeah, uh, it's offering, yeah, the principal is actually offering two option contracts, one for type 1, one for type 2. Yeah, it's incentive compatible. Yeah, and we are really having here sequential screening. Yeah, these two option contracts are, are, are different. So our claim yeah, is then, of course, that yeah, under an ex post participation constraint, yeah, sequential screening contracts are feasible but not optimal. This is not optimal. We can improve on that. So let me show you an argument. It's, yeah, for in the case of, of, of these kind of types of contracts, it's very simple. Yeah. So the gammas are, the option contracts are different. So that means that these, cut, these cutoffs are different. So suppose that J is the one with the higher one. Now, because of incentive compatibility means, yeah, J takes his contract, yeah, so the contract for J yeah, gives him at least as much utility as contract I. Yeah. Now, already here, there are already two reasons yeah, why yeah, this, contract, yeah, this contract combination cannot be optimal. Why not? There are two reasons why the principal yeah, can do better than, yeah, rather than offering this contract gamma J to type J, he should offer gamma i to type j. Why? Well, type j yeah, called, yeah, would generate more surplus yeah, under the uh, gamma i contract yeah, because yeah, the price is lower. Yeah, so we will exercise this option more often. Yeah. On the other hand, yeah, gamma i yeah, requires less rents to j. That's directly from this incentive constraint. Yeah. He takes j because it gives him more rent. Yeah, so i uh, given at most the same rents. Yeah? So that makes it very clear that yeah, if this contract cannot be optimal, it would improve the principal situation to just offer I, uh, contract I to J. Huh? Okay, so I hope this sounds convincing uh, after the lunch. Yeah? Um, I can't make it simpler than this. Yeah? I can make it harder, and I will make it harder, but I can't make it simpler. Yeah? So now you may wonder, yeah, but what about sequential screening? Yeah. What about Corti and Lee? Why does this does this not work with Corti and Lee? Well, the problem is, or the idea is, if we don't have an uh, IR constraint, an ex post IR constraint, yeah, then the contract that you're actually offering, uh, yeah, this contract uh, gamma i may actually violate, yeah, the individual rationality constraint of J. Yeah. So we have this. So offering this contract to J, yeah, would be a nice idea. Yeah, but it would be below his is participation. Okay? Yeah. In contrast, I told you yeah, that if you have an ex post participation constraint, the upfront fee is always uh, non-positive. Yeah, uh, non, non yeah? You cannot ask for a real fee. Yeah? So any contract that you can offer is always, yeah, uh, gives you always more than zero. Yeah? So yeah, uh, here we have the argument that you can actually give this I contract to J. Okay? So, yeah, what have we shown? Well, this previous argument shows that static contracts are optimal among option contracts. What is so special about option contracts? Well, option contracts are basically yeah, deterministic contracts. Yeah? So if we would have uh, uh, restricted ourselves that the x lies only between 0 and 1, either you sell it with probability 1 or with probability 0, yeah, then the representation with option contracts is it identical to uh, a general contract with a general deterministic contract. So basically what we have shown with our argument on the previous slide is that opt, uh, yeah, optimal deterministic contracts will not allow for sequential screening. So uh, Humberto is probably then not happy. Yeah, uh, he probably, Humberto would like to see. Well, what if yeah there is stochastic? Yeah, he's nodding already. So. Yeah, okay. So the, the the task is, and the real economic theory comes now because it's, this is kindergarten. Yeah, um, is to show that uh, 
to find conditions, yeah, and I show you the condition to show that the, our, under our assumptions, yeah, uh, these stochastic contracts are non-optimal. Okay, so we have to take care of possibly stochastic contracts. How do we do that? Well, we solve this, this in two steps. So the first step is standard. Yeah? This is just rewriting the problem to get this virtual surplus formulation. Yeah? Get an element, eliminating out the transfers. Yeah? And then yeah, we get a, a problem with in, in, uh, formulated in the virtual surplus. Yeah? And then we have to find out yeah, about uh, what are the right incentive constraints uh, uh, or the, yeah, identify the right incentive constraints under which we can solve our problem. Yeah, we have many incentive constraints, yeah, but we have to find out the right one. Yeah. And here, yeah, I think we 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 realize, yeah, the conceptual contribution of the paper because yeah, the usual approach will not work. Okay. So yeah, here I done the the kindergarten uh, step. Yeah, rewriting things with this virtual surplus, surplus. So you should just believe me that I did this correctly. Yeah. So you here you see that it's no longer. Uh, the formulation with the transfers. Yeah, here is simply the virtual surplus formulation that we always get. Yeah, and this is now what the principle has to maximize, given a monotonicity that x i is non-decreasing. Now this x plus in the individual rationality constraint, and we still have the x ante incent uh, incentive constraint uh, concerning the x ante type. Yeah, so this is the problem we have to solve, and I have to argue now that from this problem we get a deterministic contract. Yeah. Uh, and then I, my previous argument to show you already that sequential screening is uh, not optimal. Even though it's feasible, it's not. Okay, so why is this so much work? Yeah, why, is this, uh, why did it take us so much time? So uh, with two types, it's very simple. Yeah, um, yeah. It even took some time with two types, but yeah. three types, yeah, really, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, was not so nice. So what is the problem? Yeah. Okay, so let me illustrate what goes wrong by using a standard Merlis approach or the Myerson approach um, <coughs> when solving this problem. Yeah? So, um, uh, recall one of the benchmarks I showed you that, that I defined the theta i as the monopoly price when type i is common knowledge, where there's yeah, pri no private information at i type. That's a theta i defined by this virtual surplus cutoff. Yeah? So now just order the types, yeah? redefine the types yeah, as follows, that uh, type 3 had a smaller cutoff, monopoly cutoff than type 2 and type 1. Yeah, this, this is just a definition, redefinition, relabeling, doesn't mean anything. Yeah? But this shows you a little bit what, what, what the incentive constraints are. Yeah? So uh, theta 3 has the lowest uh, cutoff price, so actually yeah, I really would like to have the theta 3 price rather than the theta 1. Yeah, so incentive compatibility will be yeah, theta 2 would like to present to be type 3 and y 1 to be type 2. Yeah. Okay, so this sounds very, very standard. Yeah. And one way of doing solving this is, okay, we have all these incentive constraints but with three types, not that many, but still, still quite a few. Yeah, which one do I take? Well, normally I take just uh, the local ones. Yeah. So yeah, normally you just more ignore the monotonicity constraint, you take the, the local incentive constraint, you start calculating, you get something out of it, and you have to ensure that it's really monotone, and you find conditions under which it is, and then you're fine. Yeah. So why will this not work? Yeah. So suppose we do that. Yeah. So these are the neighboring constraints. Yeah. One would like to be two, two would like to be three, so those are the neighbors. Yeah. And keep things simple, start with that uh, yeah, that these utilities of the zero type is zero. Don't, don't think about that. Yeah? Okay. So one approach is to solve the problem on the previous slide, only with these incentive constraints. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Right, solve this relaxed problem, yeah, and hope that xi is non-decreasing, and then all remaining i size constraints are met. Then that's, that would be then okay. Okay, let's do that. So here's your problem. Here's our problem with only these IC constraints. Yeah. So let's just take the Rogerian, yeah, the objective minus the constraints. Yeah. Uh, because these are positive, it has to be positive. Those uh, the, the Kontaka conditions are that they must be uh, yeah, non-positive. Yeah. And consider now, yeah, the 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 yeah, derivative of this constraint with respect to the type two, yeah, uh, psi two theta. Yeah, so here I have just uh, take the derivative of it. Yeah. So, yeah, if this 
thing, if this uh, beast here yeah, is increasing, yeah, it's monotone, yeah, then we actually have yeah, uh, that we get a deterministic cutoff for type 2, yeah, and we are basically fine with type 2. Yeah. So let's see. So this part yeah, is, yes, it's increasing yeah, in theta because of the decreasing hazard rate. H2 is yeah, decreasing hazard rate. That's good. Yeah. So what about this part here? So this part is increasing yeah, because of the de decreasing cross hazard rate. Yeah? To, uh, note that the Lagrangian supplies are negative, so yeah, when this is decreasing, this whole thing is increasing. So that's good. Yeah. And now see whether, whether we have a problem. Yeah? Uh, this part here messes everything up. Yeah? My hazard rate is increasing, uh, or the, my hazard rate is decreasing, I needed that to get here the red part in the right direction, but that messes up the green part. Yeah? So the one is going up, the other one is going down, I don't know. Yeah? So it's unclear uh, what's going on. Yeah? And what's the problem? What's the problem is, there's a plus and there's a minus. Yeah? And this change of signs is actually what messes up uh, my approach. Yeah? But this plus and minus I get if I take the yeah, uh, neighboring incentive constraints. So, yeah, let's take other incentive constraints. Yeah? Let's take, yeah, rather than uh, 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 1, 2, we take 1, 3, and we keep 2, two 3. Yeah? Now, if we solve the problem with this one, yeah, uh, we, could, then we do get monotonicity. Yeah? Why? Because we don't have this problem with the plus and the minus. Now, this looks good, yeah, but uh, yeah, we have a solution only if I'm actually sure that incentive constraints 1, 3 and 2, 3 will really bind. Yeah. So this would be the right incentive constraints in some sense if I'm sure that these are the really ones who are binding my problem. Yeah. So I have to find out if I, yeah, this monotonicity I have is actually okay, yeah, that these were really the constraints that are binding me. So what do I mean with a binding constraint? I mean, if I throw it out, yeah, then I get a solution that would violate this constraint. Okay, concavity is all nice. So I'm going to uh, solve this problem again, but now I'm going to throw out IC23 and see whether IC23 is really binding. Yeah? Now, if I solve this problem, what do I get? Yeah, I get that theta two hat is a cutoff. Yeah, at theta two, yes. And this is the monopoly solution if the principal knew it was type, type, type 2, sorry, this should be a 2. Yeah? And what I have is basically bunching between type 1 and type 3. Yeah? There, then the principal will offer a monopoly cutoff, that's the monopoly cutoff, if he did not know yeah, that it was 1 or 3. So where he would know it's not 2, but he's not sure about 1 and 3. Then he takes the average distribution of 1 and 3, and you can calculate this, this cutoff. Now everything is, yeah, this would really violate, yeah, uh, <coughs> IC23, yeah, when, yeah, this cutoff we get, these two cutoffs, yeah, are ordered in a such a way that theta 2 is larger than theta 1 out of 3 bar. Because then type 2 would really like to pretend to be the 1, 3 type, yeah, and this solution here, yeah, violates IC23. Yeah. Well, this happens when theta 2 is larger than this average theta bar. So only if theta 2 is larger than the average theta bar, yeah, then uh, I have now shown that indeed yeah, the optimal contract is deterministic and I have what I've got, yeah, and the sequ sequential screening is not optimal. Everything is like I promised it to be. So, when the, uh, wh wh whether theta 2 is actually larger than theta bar hell, yeah, depends of course on the primitives, yeah, on the PIs and the GIs. Yeah? It can be, yeah, but it could also be the other way around. Yeah, and then I have a problem again. Yeah. What kind of solution do we then have? Yeah. Well then, yeah, what happens to work is if I take other sets of incentive constraints, I should not have thrown out 1, 2, I should have thrown out IC2, 3 and replaced it by IC1, 3. Now I can do the whole, uh, uh, yeah, the whole song, song and dance, and this is uh, from David, yeah, again. Yeah, and yeah, I get actually that yeah, I get against monotonicity. Everything is fine. Yeah, under the condition that this incentive constraint is then really binding, and it's actually yeah binding yeah actually in the case I'm now in. Yeah, so yeah, 
and this, so depending on the, di the distributions, yeah, I have to take different descent of constraints. Okay. So now your question is, of course, well, yeah, so with three types it works. Yeah. What about four types? What about five types? What about six types? Yeah. What about n types? Yeah. <coughs> that was yeah, after showing this with three types, it took us uh, half a year but until a year. Yeah. We did four types, which took us three quarters of a year. Yeah. And we even did five types, and it always worked. So, yeah, the whole problem is how many minutes do I have? Eight minutes. Eight minutes. Okay, that should be, should be more or less okay. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, in general, yeah, we would like to have this for n, n types. Not two, not three, not four, not five. Yeah. Okay, sorry. No, it's fine. Fine. So that was the aspirin. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what is the general problem? Yeah, we have to find a set of incentive constraints, yeah, so that uh, all types, yeah, all ex ante types, yeah, uh, uh, when we then have this yeah, relaxed problem, we solve this relaxed problem, we have the monotonicity satisfied, and at the same time, we really know that we took the right incentive constraints in the sense that they're really binding. Okay. So uh, yeah, after three, uh, yeah, after three types, four types, five types, yeah, we finally got a very lengthy constructive procedure to identify the ICs. Yeah, it, uh, we actually wrote down the proof. It took 40 pages because it's uh, by induction and uh, 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 three or four times induction. Yeah. So um, yeah, so we thought a little bit more. Yeah, and we now have a sh much shorter indirect pr uh, pr procedure to identify the ICs. Yeah, so you may have may have heard a different version where we have this procedure. It looks very impressive, but I'm um, sorry, we we now do it differently. Okay, so what do we do? Yeah, we have to identify the subset of IC constraints, find the subset C of those pairs of IC constraints. What we do then is, yeah, we then consider the relaxed problem. We only take the set of constraints from this uh, constraint set. Yeah, we then build this uh, virtual Langevin like we. I did with three types, yeah. And notice again, yeah, uh, there are in general minuses and pluses, yeah. So I should take the right ones, right C's, so that I don't end up with minuses and pluses, yeah. Overall, yeah. And then if I do that, yeah, then the static solution solves this problem, yeah. If I find my my multipliers, yeah, so that we have monotonicity, yeah, and uh, I have a cutoff, yeah. The cutoff is this this this. Uh, uh, this uh, static uh, cutoff, yeah, and I have the uh, multipliers with the right signs, yeah, non-positive. Okay, so uh, how do we do that? So um, yeah, the three-type case gives you some information what what to do. Yeah. So we call a set C directed, yeah, if uh, if I J, so instead of constraint I J is in C, it means that there's no other instead of constraint in J, so that K, K I is in J, yeah. So if A I is, yeah, uh, yeah, I likes to be likes to be J, yeah. Then there's no K who likes to be I, yeah. That's a little bit the the idea, yeah. And the trick with this directed is that we actually end up with a, this virtual uh, formulation, this big psi, yeah, with either only minuses or only pluses, yeah. Okay. And then, yeah, uh, we have the monotonicity uh, in the, in, uh, so, yeah, in the psi, yeah. And yeah, like I told you, these Molise constraints, just the neighboring constraints, are actually the wrong ones, yeah. Because then we always have pluses and minus, and that screws things up. So, yeah, what is now the recipe to find the, the C star? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> so uh, you saw that, yeah, what was what was important in the, in the in the three-type example, is whether this monopoly, monopoly cutoff for type I is larger, larger or smaller than the average theta bar, yeah? and that's the key yeah, inside to construct your C set, C star set. Yeah? So what we're going to do is we're going to put only I J's in C star, yeah, with theta I's uh, 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 when theta I is smaller than theta bar, and the J when the theta J is larger than theta bar. Yeah, those are the C's that are going to matter. Yeah, only those we will put in our relaxed program, program and only those, well, for, for those we will then maximize. Yeah? 
And then, yes, so uh, by construction, the C star is directed, so we don't have the minus plus problem problem. Yeah? And then, yeah, the indirect procedure is to use Farkas lemma to show that actually, yeah, you find these non-positive non multipliers, so that at theta bar, yeah, you have this cutoff. Yeah? Okay, so let me, come, yeah? That's now the proof. Yeah, it takes more, more than one page, but uh, substantially less than 40. Yeah. Um, so, but that's how, how, how things work. So let me just conclude. Yeah. So what do we do? Yeah, we uh, yeah, uh, we uh, introduce ex post participation constraint in yeah, the standard sequential screening model. Yeah. And we then show that uh, stat static uh, screening, uh, yeah, static contracts are optimal. You don't want to screen sequentially. Even though you can, yeah? so it's not an infeasibility result. The principle could do it, but it's simply too costly. Yeah? So, uh, yeah, yeah, so uh, what about, yeah, um, how robust is the result? Yeah, you might wonder, or you might be, well, what about, yeah, I took the, the participation constraint, the ex ante, and the ex post participation constraint is both zero. Yeah? What if there's a difference, whether when it's the ex post participation constraint, uh, yeah, you can have some negativity there, but not, yeah, not zero. Yeah, according to the EU regulation, yeah, now, yeah, the, you, when you send back to your good to withdraw, you actually have to pay the postage, yeah, so you lose a little bit of money. Yeah. Um, so the ex post outside option can be smaller than the ex ante outside option. Yeah, uh, there's a bound, of course. Yeah, but uh, it's bounded away. Yeah, this 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 lower bound, and we still have our result. Yeah, of course, if this bound is very very, uh, uh, yeah, so the, if the outside option is much much smaller than the ex ante outside option, we go back to core and Lee uh, framework. Okay, so uh, yeah, just back to uh, to the application. Yeah, so we confirm that in the context of the. Uh, EU regulation withdrawal rights restore this informational position of the consumer. That seemed to have been the, the main issue from the perspective of the of the uh, of the EU. Yeah, so this EU regulation withdrawal right goes back to to nineties. Yeah, and there were no Im Amazon yet. Yeah, so we did not have real browsers. Yeah, so if you read what they were thinking about, they, they were yeah, selling goods over Minitel. I don't know the French people here where, whether they still know Minitel. Yeah. Where yeah, you really and there were no pictures. Yeah, it was just text, and you could order something. Yeah, so the information. Yeah, now you see all the, the nice information and with pictures and everything. Yeah, but at the time, informational position was really bad if you bought something in, over Minitel. Yeah. And uh, moreover, yeah, uh, the withdrawal rights yeah really levels the playing field between the internet and the traditional shops. Yeah, so uh, that's not that's not originally the idea of the EU. Yeah. Regulators, yeah, but yeah, there's no yeah uh, average, uh, no, no artificial advantage of internet stores now uh, over the traditional stores to yeah to uh, uh, yeah, for selling goods. Yeah, and you may be worried that there's an uh, artificial uh, competitive anti-competitive effect uh, of uh, internet shops versus traditional shops. And I'll leave it there. And uh, now Xavier is gonna discuss the paper. Actually, I was planning to do this presentation before Roland, so I will have to change a little bit. Uh, so uh, this paper uh, deals with uh, withdrawal rights. Uh, Roland introduced the withdrawal rights in, in sales contracts. Uh, they just work. Ju they work just like a kind of a, a a cooling, cooling off period. You buy the good and then if you realize that the good is not uh, what you, you wanted and then you can return the good to the seller. So, um, so actually it's mostly important for when we're considering online stores. But uh, you can apply this the same kind of technique to other other fields also like jobs and, you know, and and other stuff okay so for example in Brazil when you buy a good online you have seven days return and in Europe you have two weeks and you can return the, the, the good to the seller uh, and actually uh, 
uh, at least in nowadays you can when you, you you want to buy some good actually you have a lot of information that uh, I'm not sure if uh, if it's correct to say that the, the, the buyer is so uninformed uh, he's not as un, as informed as buying in a physical store but you can read reviews about the good you can you can see pictures you can have a lot of, a lot of information and nowadays before buying the uh, goods online okay so uh, actually I would like to 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 ask uh, Roland, uh, why do you think it's necessary for the regulator to, to impose the withdrawal rights? Uh, for example, in a physical store, if you buy a jeans and the jeans, if you buy a, a jeans to, to your wife and the jeans doesn't fit, she can go to the store and, and change the, the good. And so I'm not sure if the, the regulation, the regulator is the, the main issue here. If you can do in a physical store, uh, I, I don't think that uh, the fact that you're buying in an online store is the main difference that makes, uh, for example, you can, uh, you need the regulator to impose a law that obliges the, the, the seller in an online store to, to change the goods. So, uh, do you think it's too necessary for... Yeah, so, so first of all, this is a positive analysis. Yeah, so the regulation is there. Uh, our question is first to understand what effect it has. Yeah, then yeah, we also have some welfare effects, welfare analysis. Yeah, uh, and we show that the welfare effects are very unclear. Yeah, so I'm totally yeah. on your side that uh, that from a wealth, pure welfare perspective, uh, this regulation would not make sense, even if the story about information is is the relevant one. Yeah? Okay. Okay. Uh, just uh, I did a little uh, resume of the the paper, and I don't think it's uh, it's necessary to talk about this now. But uh, actually, I think the main results uh, of this paper are when uh, you have actually let, let's go back to the timing. You have the excellent uh, in private information that is this this I and the distribution function GI that it's revealed to the buyer in, in the period one and then you have this uh, data, uh, the, the private information that it's, it's a random variable that has this distribution function here and the, the customer just uh, learns this, this, this data uh, when after after buying the the good, so the results here are uh, when you are considering uh, deterministic contracts, uh, uh, an incentive compat uh, compatible uh, determinist, determinist contract is equivalent to a menu of option contracts. That is just something like that, like this. Uh, the, the, these numbers here represents the the accent types. But uh, if the buyer has withdrawal rights, this kind of option contract uh, is simple. You, you don't need uh, to do the screening in the accent types. You only have uh, the, 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 uh, this uh, this menu of options reduced to something like this, and so you have a kind of a simple contract. And then uh, Roland uh, works with. Uh, stochastic contracts and the in general when you work with stochastic contracts uh, the idea is to uh, is to define a kind of a relaxed problem and if the solution of the relaxed problem is implementable then you don't need to 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 consider uh, this kind of stochastic contracts. Here is a little bit different because uh, the, the, the local analysis is not sufficient to to eliminate the the stochastic contract. So uh, actually, you have to consider this cross hazard rate condition, and with this condition, you can select the global constraints that will be relevant to the problem. So after doing this, you will conclude that the, even if you consider uh, stochastic contracts uh, you, you can you can get uh, a profit expected profit 
that is bigger than the one that you than the one when you just consider uh, determinist contracts. So this actually it took before uh, 40 pages, but <laughs> now you just simplify it with the issue. Uh, and I have another question. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if it's uh, it's relevant, but what if you consider um, the accent types, uh, continuous accent types? Uh, do you think that? Yeah, so then our uh, for our procedure, in order to identify these con the right constraints, yeah, uh, we have to make that discrete. Yeah? Yeah. So I mean, any number of accent types is okay, yeah, but yeah. Uh, um, it's, it's, for, uh, it's only for, for, for types. Our, our our constructive procedure, yeah, developed by induction, yeah, so we then really need a discrete type. So actually, I don't know. Maybe we should look at that. Yeah, if we if this indirect co the works, but I don't know whether Farkas lemma also works with uh, the continuous. Does it work? Where is it? Is there a Farkas lemma with infinite with continuous? The separation. You may have some yeah. Okay. So, uh, but I think I think we're happy with with n types. Yeah. Right? So, um, either you do with n types or with the continuum. But uh, yeah, if there will be a difference between the n types and the continuum, it's, yeah. Uh, I actually be surprising for the n types rather than the continuum. Actually, uh, just some further questions. Um, and uh, what happens when the seller has the private information, for example, that you, you, in your case you're considering that the buyer has the private information, and for example, you can consider the withdrawal rights, for example, in a physical store, they, they, the, the customer has withdrawal rights in a physical store, and you can think of a, a kind of a signaling of quality or something, or a, a result for a competition. If you don't do this, the other store will, will give you this right. And, it, and in post purchase is just something that I put that is related to online, <laughs> online buying, maybe some and you don't you don't touch this, this kind of so so I should send motivation. you the new version so we look a little bit at that maybe you will be not not happy with that either because we cannot do very much yeah so if if we have two sided asymmetric information things become very very hairy yeah and uh, we discussed it a little bit in the newest version yeah Mora has it also from the from the uh, from the perspective of the principal, yeah. So does he give a good service with the with the internet sale or, or, or something? And like you said, adverse selection is the quality, okay. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we concentrate on the asymmetric information of the, of the on the part of the agent. Yeah. Okay. So this is all my considerations, and I would like to thank you for. The well, thank you for the for the. Yeah. Just just one 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 comment. Yeah. So you 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 started with saying the cooling off. Yeah, so the cooling off issue is, is not an issue from the regulator's perspective. Yeah. yeah so they, they say there are there, well, we found actually discussions with between regulators where they say uh, cooling off is something for doorstep sales. So also for doorstep sales, they, you have a withdrawal right. Yeah. So this is different from internet sales. Yeah. And for the the, the rationale for the withdrawal right from from doorstep sales, yeah, is the cooling off period. Yeah, that you are pressured into buying stuff. But for the internet, it's, it's being considered that you know, nowadays everybody sits and relaxed and doesn't feel pressure to, to buy over the internet. So it's not so much the cooling, it's more this informational position and we try to capture that um, with our, our, our model. Yeah. Okay, okay. Thank, uh, thank you very much. Vinny. Now we have some time uh, for questions, David. Thank you. So the, the case with uh, withdrawal uh, rights and the case without are two polar situations uh, that you, you could uh, uh, describe in another setup. Also. Suppose I take Courtilly, but with, prefer with risk aversion, where the case of infinite risk aversion covers the case where you have this exposed uh, uh, participation constraint, and the case without uh, with risk neutrality correspond clearly to, to the Courtilly and their framework. Is there, suppose that the risk aversion is constant to simplify, is there a degree of risk aversion uh, above which you, uh, 
don't use a sequential contract, or is it the case that with risk aversion, you use uh, always a little bit of sequentiality in some sense? Yeah, so, so yeah, you asked this question before, uh, when, you, when you saw my other papers, right? Uh, uh, so, uh, are you, uh, and I was very thankful at the time, yeah, but then we looked at I, it. I already asked this question. Yeah, you already asked this okay, question. Okay, so this means that and, I'm really uh, sick. We, we <laughs> <laughs> so, um, actually, yeah. But then, yeah, then we thought about it, and then actually risk aversion is very different. So it does not work, but I forgot why. So I have to think about now. Yeah, but so what, what does it work? Discussion about two signals. So <laughs> what does not work? The inter interpretation of the participation, ex post participation, as, as oh. extreme risk aversion is, is not a correct correct way of looking things. I also thought that you were absolutely right, but... Um, even, even with car preferences? Uh, yeah, no, no. It's, it's a different, it's something different. So, um, but uh, I... Uh, I should have been able to answer it exactly, but but um, I will write you. So we'll ask why, why. I will ask it again. Yeah. <laughs> Third time, then I better. Yeah, so, so, so thank you very much. Sir.